First Kings chapter 2, very transitional time in Israel's history. David, a godly king, was nearing death, and he was turning the kingdom over, kingdom's rule to his son Solomon. Scripture reads this way in 1 Kings 2, verse 1. It says, When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. He says, Be strong and show yourself a man. Be strong and and show yourself a man and keep the charge of the Lord your God walking in his ways and keeping his statutes his commandments his rules and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me saying if your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel in Job 38, 3 and also 40, verse 7, Job is having an encounter with God. And God says to Job, gird up your loins like a man. Gird up your loins like a man. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth and obviously addressing the leaders. And he says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith. And he says, act like men, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. God is clear and he's unambiguous in communicating that there is a way of thinking, there are attitudes and way of behaving that's consistent with being a man as distinguished from a, from a woman. Um, there are assigned to man roles, responsibilities, and duties that are just simply different than those that are assigned to women. And most men... Though they might be confused about what it means to be a man and what they're supposed to do and all of that, deep, most men, deep in the recesses of their being, they, they, they know that they think differently than women. And they know that there's certain things that there's, even if they don't know what they are, they know there's certain things that they ought to be doing in certain ways they ought to be acting that are manly or that, that, that are masculine. There is something that might be called a biblical masculinity. Um, I've said this before. You could be married to, your wife could be like the MMA champion. You know, I mean, she could probably beat you in a match and get you in whatever the hold is or knock you out. But if you're walking down the street in some city and a bad guy jumps out from the side, you don't step aside and say, hey, honey, go get him. There's something that you're, you're hardwired in some way, even if she were more capable in it, to step in there and put yourself between danger and your wife or danger and your family. Almost 25 years ago now, comedian and author Garrison Keillor, he penned a book. It's so relevant. It's called The Book of Guys. And I'm going to read you just a section of it. Uh, Keillor was, I suppose, honestly, trying to get honest with himself, you know, as, as a man. Uh, he decided to make a list of his strengths and his weaknesses. So in the book, he's got this one uh, subheading or heading, and it says, useful things I can do. And under that, he has be nice, make a bed, dig a hole, write books, sing alto or bass, read a map, see as before GPS, 25 years ago, drive a car. And then he had another heading, and it says, useful things I can't do. Chop down big trees and cut them into lumber or firewood. Handle a horse, train a dog, or tend a herd of animals. Handle a boat without panicking the others. Throw a fastball, curve, or slider. Load, shoot, clean a gun, or a bow and arrow, or use either of them, or a spear, a net, a snare, a boomerang, or a blowgun to obtain meat to, uh, uh, to eat, or defend myself with my bare hands. Now, Keeler goes on to say, maybe it's an okay report card for a person. Maybe it's an okay report card for a person, but I don't know any persons. For a guy, it's not good. A woman would go down the list and say, what does it matter if a guy can handle a boat, throw a curveball, bag a deer, throw a left hook? He said, but that's a womanly view of manhood. There's just something. This guy isn't a Christian. There's just something that's in there. It says, you know, we're, we're different. Different, uh, different in some of our attitudes. And, you know, most men know even if they can't put it into any kind of precise language, even if they can't 
put it into some kind of politically correct language, even if they can't just kind of get their head around it, they know deep in the recesses of their being that there's something different about them, more than physiologically different. There's something different about them than there, are, than there is women or from women in distinction from women. And there are certain duties and responsibilities that are their, theirs and things that they're supposed to do in ways that they're supposed to act. It seems to me, and I think I'm on good ground here, it seems to me, though, that there's a whole lot of guys, both in the church and outside the church, that are sort of confused about you know, manhood. What does it mean to be a man? Show yourself to be a man. I mean, when David said to uh, Solomon back there, show yourself to be a man, it just simply assumes there was a collective idea of what it means to be a man, how men think, how they act, and what their responsibilities are. When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, I mean, that's in the first century, hundreds of years after that uh, message to Solomon, and he says, act like men. Be strong. There was a collective idea, both among believers and even unbelievers, and they didn't always get it right, but about what it meant to be a man. But that no longer exists today. There's a lot of confusion over manhood and masculinity. Some of the confusion is just simply the result of a changing culture. I think in a good-hearted attempt to address issues like uh, sexism, discrimination, prejudice, insensitivity, what's happened is the lines between masculinity and femininity have, have been blurred. And in fact, in some circles, it seems like androgyny is the ideal. You know, no longer male nor female. And words like sex and gender have spawned a whole host of new words and birthed new definitions. Just this last week, or perhaps it was the week before, I was online. I'm saying, okay, well, let me look at this thing, you know, sex, gender, male, female. And this is what I came across. These are all new, relatively new things. One, uh, there's what's called assigned sex. Assigned sex is your biological sex. Then there's gender. There's gender identity, transgender, size gender, gender expression, uh, ah gender, androgynous, bigender, binary, gender dysphoria, gender fluid, gender non-conforming, gender questioning, gender queer, misgender, non-binary, and still more. I mean, I long for the days when it was male and female. I mean, there's confusion because who am I, what am I, etc. I think there's massive confusion, particularly among men. Uh, uh, who am I and what am I to do and what's it look like to be uh, a man? Some confusion exists even among those who name the name of Christ because whole denominations have abandoned the authority of Scripture. In other words, they no longer look to the, the Bible as authoritative and binding on their faith and on their morals and even on their thinking. Timothy Johnson, who's, um, well, he's classified as a New Testament scholar, although I find that questionable, but he teaches at Emory University. That's a theological school of the United Methodist Church. And he's, he's a supporter, along with a bunch of his pals, of same-sex marriage. But I want you to listen how he explains his support for that. What we're at is, look, there are... Uh, some people that are confused just because of the changing culture. There's people even confused in the church because they've abandoned the authority of Scripture. This guy at least is honest. This is what he, he says when he's explaining his support for same-sex marriage. He said, I think it is important to state clearly, we do, meaning him, we do in fact reject the straightforward commands of Scripture. In other words, we can read the Scripture. We know what it says. Let's be upfront about this. We're not going to play with words. We're not going to do some of the things that others do. I have, after all, I'm a New Testament scholar. I know what the Greek says. So he says, I think it's important to say clearly, we do, in fact, reject the straightforward commands of Scripture, and we appeal instead to another authority when we declare that same-sex unions can be holy and good. Appeal to another authority. And what exactly is that authority? We appeal, he says, explicitly to the weight of our own experience and the experience thousands of others have witnessed to, which tells us to claim our own, that to claim our own sexual orientation is in fact to accept the way in which God has created us. So 
where, where am I going? Boy, there's confusion over what it means to be uh, a, a man. What, what does biblical masculinity look like? Some of it's due to just this changing culture. But there's a changing church culture. And when you abandon the authority of Scripture, anything goes, because then you can make appeals to other authorities, namely your experience and the experience of others. And finally, I think there's confusion over what it means to be a man. What does a biblical man look like? Simply because, uh, look... The, the, the sinful part of us, even as Christians, even the sinful part of us, we tend to opt for ease and leisure and, and comfort. And it just seems like, Pastor George, if you're going to talk about what the Bible says about being a man, I just, I'm, I'm afraid that sounds like it might be hard. And you know what? If a wife wants to do it, good for her. If somebody else wants to do it, good for them. And, you know, if society is saying I don't have to be like that, good for them. You know what? It's just too hard. And there's, you know what? Some men are confused just simply due to the blinding effects of sin. You know, I'd rather opt for an easy, easy road. I'd rather opt for an easier way. So there's without, there's without doubt a fair amount of confusion. So let's turn. Let's look at what God has to say because we still do believe in the authority of Scripture and we believe that it's binding. Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. talking specifically about the Lord creating Adam, creating the first man. The Bible reads this way. It says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust. Then the Lord God formed. I, I, I want you to get this. The Lord God formed. That's going to be an important word. The Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living creature. The Hebrew word translated in my translation, formed, means fashioned, shaped, or forged, usually by plan or design. The forming is thoughtful and strategic. It's, it's a forming with future actions in, in mind. Man was formed and fashioned so that he could act and function in accord with his manly assignment. In other words, what I want you to see right off the bat is that when God formed man, when he formed man, it was thoughtful and it was strategic and he was formed in such a way so that he could do what God purposed for him to do. It's kind of like if you have a toolbox and you know you got hammers and screwdrivers and wrenches and ratchets and you got all that stuff in it. That stuff was forged and formed for a particular function. And when you, try, uh, when you try to use something that wasn't formed for a particular form, it doesn't work. It becomes dysfunctional. But the Bible says right in the beginning, and specifically with man, did the same for, for women, but in a little bit different way. Specifically with man, boy, he was formed and fashioned, strategic and thoughtful, so that he could function in a particular way. Well, what was man formed to be? Let me just point out a couple things. And uh, we'll look at it a little bit more closely. When you read through Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, and then later on you look in the New Testament, but we'll stick with Genesis 1, 2, and 3 in large part right now. When you look at creation order, man was created before the woman. So you might say, well, big deal. Who cares? What makes it a big deal is Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2 appeals to creation order when appealing to man's place of leadership in the home and in the church. We also find this, that in verse, uh, let's see, verse 17, or actually the end of 16 and then into 17, God says, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you will surely die. Uh, Adam is the one to whom God communicated the limits to. He didn't communicate it to Adam and Eve, he communicated it to Adam. When we go further, when you look at 18 and following, Adam is given the responsibility of naming all the rest of the animals. That naming function is a leadership function. It's an authoritative function. In uh, Genesis chapter 3, it is Adam that gives the name to Eve. And when we look in Genesis chapter 3 and then also in the New Testament, we, we know, right, that it was Eve. Eve who talked to the serpent, who talked to the devil. It was Eve who took the fruit, and it was Eve who gave the fruit to Adam. But yet you can read through, read through Genesis chapter 3. It's unmistakable. And then get into the New Testament. 
Adam bore the greater responsibility for that sin. So, okay, we come all, all the way back. So, what in the world is Adam formed for? What is he fashioned for? Well, one of the things that we can say he's formed and fashioned for is he's formed and fashioned in order to, or so that, he would lead. And in the New Testament, we find that leadership exemplified in Christ. In fact, we should say, we could probably say this. If you're going to show yourself to be a man, show yourself to be like Christ. But then Christ becomes the perfect example for us as well as the power for us. If you're a man, this is how you lead. Well, also, this notion of leadership is expressed in the New Testament, obviously in Christ, but is also expressed in a word uh, that's translated head. The Bible says that Man is the, or a husband is the head of his wife, just as Jesus is the head of the church. And then it goes further and he says, and the husband is to love his wife just as Christ loves the church. This whole notion and the concept behind it of head and headship denotes authoritative, sacrificial, loving leadership. It's inescapable if you're going to bow the knee to the authority of Scripture. So guys, you do not get to shirk your duty. You do not get to sit back and let your kids lead the way or lead you around. Or even for that matter, as you're walking together in partnership with your wife, guess what? Look at the garden. You know, Eve really went astray initially, um, but Adam bore the greater responsibility. You don't have the right as a Christian to allow your wife to lead where you should be leading. Now, you lead in partnership, but you lead nonetheless. So uh, what was man formed and created and thoughtfully and strategically fashioned to do? To lead lovingly, sacrificially. Uh, that means, guys, you lay down your life. If you're married, you lay down your life for your wife, for your children. You serve uh, other people. Now, so you lead in your families. You lead in the church. And... Uh, even, even in the public square, for that matter. Now we push a little bit further in Genesis once again, and we get a little bit more detail and a little more clarity on, remember, this is what we're going, where I'm going is this. Here's the problem. There's a lot of confusion over what it means to be a man. And when there's a lot of confusion over what it be, means to be a man, and men don't lead, and they don't lead in the world, and they don't lead in the church, and they don't know what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to act, well, I'll tell you, there's chaos everywhere because God has an order for things. And we recognize why there's confusion. And now what we're trying to do is we're trying to come back and we're going to say, well, what does God say? And then how do we do it? Well, God says you lead lovingly and sacrificially you lead. We get into verse 15 of Genesis. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. Put him in the Garden of Eden to work it. The Hebrew that underlies this word work or work it means to work, to serve, to cultivate in order to bear fruit. It's a work that produces what is necessary for sustaining life. In fact, I'd even go a little bit further with it. I'm not, I don't think I'm taking liberty with any of the Hebrew. It's a work that produces healthy life. So what a, what a man, we, many of you know this, but what, what is a man formed in fashion to do? Well, to lead, a man is formed in fashion to provide. I mean, men are to be providers. That doesn't mean that his wife doesn't work. That doesn't mean any of those kinds of things. What it does mean is that there is a, provi there, there is a provision, there is a uh, sense of providing that a man is obligated to do. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, you don't work, you don't eat. I, I think I've said to you before, one of the first scriptures that my kids learned after John 3.16 was 2 Thessalonians 3.10. I think if you ask my daughter Kelly, if she comes in the uh, second service, if you see her, and, and you ask her 2 Thessalonians 3.10, I think she still knows it. You don't, if you don't work, you don't eat. For, first uh, Timothy 5.8, I think it's 5.8, it says, if a man doesn't provide for his own family, it says he is worse than an infidel. I don't know, worse than an unbeliever. How do you get worse than that? Because you're under the judgment of God. And he's denied to faith. Who would have ever thought that one of the ways that you reveal whether or not you're a follower of Christ if you're a man is whether or not you work or, or, or don't? In other words, if you're a lazy male, I'm not talking about because of illness or injury or just life situation, it just simply came about. Well, I'm talking about somebody that's just lazy and doesn't work. You don't work, you don't eat, and if you don't work and you don't take care of your family, then you're worse than an unbeliever and you're denied to faith. So it seems to me, I actually had a conversation with somebody years and years ago. It was over a phone conversation because he was in another state, 
And um, he just, some bad things were happening in his marriage. And uh, his wife was really, they were separated, was really very willing to reconcile with him. But uh, she, they had a kid and things like that. And he just, he wasn't, ta- he didn't give her any money, didn't take care of her. He was just common vanagia. He's just a bum. So I'm talking to him. He says, well, aren't you a Christian? You know, Christians aren't supposed to blah, 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 blah. You know, he's moaning to me because his wife is separated and I'm not seeming to be as supportive as he wanted me to be, even though he doesn't know me. And I did. I, I, quoted, I told him the scripture. I said, well, you know what First Timothy says? It says, if you don't take care of your wife, you don't take care of your family, you don't take care of your kids, and you don't, I said, you're worse than an infidel, and you've denied the faith. I said, so in so many words, and I was pretty blunt with him. Um, in so many words, I told him, you know, in, in my eyes, you're an unbeliever. So I'm treating you as an unbeliever. You need to come to Jesus. That's what the scripture says. So guys are supposed to lead. And guy, you got this responsibility to provide. You know, work isn't part of the curse. Work is part of what God gave Adam to do in the garden. Work is something that we get to do in heaven. It's just a whole bunch more protective in heaven. Colossians says this. Colossians 3.23 says, work hard and cheerfully at whatever you do. Works good and ennobling. I just want to urge all of you, all you, everyone out here, but particularly I'm addressing guys and probably particularly young guys, take responsibility for your work and career. I mean, do some basic things. I mean, be on time at work and work hard, and you probably got a leg up on 95% of the rest of the, the workforce. And do what's expected, and do a little bit more than that. And young men, uh, I don't know if we got any young guys in here, or maybe you categorize, categorize yourself as young men. But you ought to have formulated some kind of clear thoughts about your work and career before marriage. Know, know where you're headed before you decide to take a wife along. I, I think it's great. I, I love Genesis where God puts him to work in the garden. See, what he did is he gave, it, he gave Adam a job before he gave him a wife. That's the way it's supposed to work. You get a job before you get the woman. Not vice versa. You don't say, man, she's got a really good job. We'll be able to pay our bills. And just along the way, you know, um, especially if you're a young guy in the church, begin to ask God and ask other godly men what work there is, you know, what work there is for you to do. Um, And I'll add this, just so that we don't miss it, because guy, a man, what is it, show yourself a man, well, you're to be a provider, you're to be a leader, you're to be a provider. Now, provision has to do with this uh, producing fruit that results in life or healthy life. It's never less than that, but it is more than that. So don't think just because you have a job and you pay the bills that you're, you're okay. Ephesians 5 seems to indicate otherwise. And when we look to Jesus and we say, well, if we're going to act like men, we need to act like Jesus. He took responsibility for the whole person, meaning spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, in every way. If you're married you do have a responsibility. Ephesians 5 says to nourish and to cherish your wife. And, and that nourishing isn't just food. Right? Okay, we got some, yeah. We, now, now, probably, if we were in another setting and I asked you, okay, what is that? You'd look at me with a dumb look and you're like, I have no idea. But there's ways that you nourish and there's ways that you cherish and you do that emotionally and you do that psychologically and in your leadership capacity and your providing capacity, you also do it spiritually. You take a role of leadership in the home spiritually and what you begin to do is you begin to feed your wife and your family spiritually, even if she knows more than you. You do that and you set the agenda so we come back here again. Genesis 2, verse 15. It doesn't work, end with, with uh, work it because it says this. The Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Hebrew word that underlines that. Um, means to guard, means to protect, to care for, and look out for. So a man is to be a leader, a man is to be a provider, and a man is to be a protector. Physically, spiritually, mind heart. Um, this is just hardwired into guys. Now there might be physical, because uh, we can talk a lot about, you know, physically defending and protecting and things like that. Boy, I'll tell you, you suffer debilitating illness, disease, you get old. Uh, 
it becomes, it becomes more difficult. I think the primary thing is not physical protection, but physical protection, at least the notion of it, certainly has to be in, in the, the, the realm of what we talk about. I've had conversations with my wife. I remember being at a small group, and we were at the small group, and somebody brought up the fact that there were homes in our area that were being broken into. And they suspected that it was more that it was like a, a team of people and things like that. And so the guy stepped right up like what they could do to protect their home. And I did too in my brain because I started to think, um, and see, I'm probably extreme with this, but I started to think, okay, they're saying there's more than one. See, that changes the dynamics because if there's one, I just need to subdue him till the police come. But if there's more than one, I got to take somebody out really quick like neutralize them big time because then if I'm dealing with the other one, I don't want him to recover and come get back on me. So we're having this conversation. <laughs> Would you say amen? Yeah, that's what you're thinking. So me, me and Kitty are riding home and we're having this conversation. She says, I never think about things like that. I said, I guess not. I said, this responsibility has been assigned to me. I said, somebody breaking into our house and we're going to have multiple people. I'm thinking about how I can handle them as quickly as possible. And if they're multiple, who knows? I'm going to at least give it a shot. But whoever that first guy is, is going to be the worst one <laughs> because he's gone. But that's what you think about. You know, I tell her, you know, we go to the airport, right? We're in the airport. I don't know what you are, but you're, I'm checking everybody out. Okay, let's see. Where am I sitting? I'm going to get an aisle seat. I want to have a little bit of room so I can get out. Is there anybody that looks suspicious to me? <laughs> you know, because you're there and you're trying to, you're looking, you're, 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 you're just, you're looking out and that's how you're wired. And again, I might be further along than some, but I'll tell you, every guy when they're in there and you're with you, if you're married, you got your wife or you got your kids and you got everything, you, you are, you're, you're scoping things out. Just, uh, I got to keep an eye on things. Got to see who's, <laughs> got to see who's there, who poses a potential threat. So a man's to be a protector. I don't want to negate because I just use physically as an example, but you do get to uh, places and there's some situations that you can't do that. Don't forget about spiritually. The Bible says that, in fact, make this primary. The Bible says the devil goes about as an adversary seeking whom he may devour. We have a real adversary. We have a devil who wants the souls of your kid. We have a, de we have a devil who wants to disrupt your wife's life if you're married. We have a devil who is opposed to the purpose of God. Let me urge you, as a man of God, you stand in the gap and you pray and you go to war for your family, for your kids, for your grandkids, as far out. Ask the God, if they're not saved, ask God to open up their hearts. Ask God to open up their minds. Pray for them and intercede for them. Uh, if you got kids that are in the house, or even if they're outside of the house, if you can even engage them in productive discussions about how they ought to be thinking about the world without dictating to them, you know, they hate that. So it's, well, did you ever think about this? Helping them in their worldview, helping them in the way they look at things. Because I'll tell you what, if you got young kids and they're going to school, they're getting trained, they're inter interacting with peers, most of whom are not saved, and they're picking things up outside of your presence, you need to be aware of it. And guys, you've got to take the responsibility for it. A man's to be a protector. Please, be willing to talk to your young men. You know, talk to your boys about... What, what it means to be a man, about how you're supposed to treat women, about how you're supposed to work, what you're supposed to do in life, what it looks like to be a God-honoring uh, man. And please, talk to your kids. Talk to your, talk to, if you've got young kids and your, your son, before he, you know, you got to do it when he's pretty young. I mean, talk to him about sex. Do you know, I do, I do a lot of, uh, or I've done a lot of counseling, and I still do a fair amount of counseling. And uh, so often with dealing with young couples, they either just got, they got married or they're getting married. And I will ask them the question somewhere along the road, how did you learn about sex? Like who taught you? What did you learn? I can say this, very subjective, overwhelmingly they say pornography. Overwhelmingly. I mean, really? Should we leave it to the, 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 the porn purveyors to teach our kids? Protect your kids. Teach them. Teach your young women. Teach, them. teach your young women about what it means to be, a, what biblical femininity looks like. 
Uh, and guys, you can actually do that too because you can model the way a guy's supposed to treat a woman and the way your wife responds and things like that. Uh, and, and be willing, here, here's the thing, be, be willing to uh, teach your daughters about guys. Because even if your wife, here, here's the thing, every guy knows this. Even if your wife thinks she knows how guys really are and how they think, no woman really knows how a guy thinks. If any woman really knew what went on in a guy's brain, <laughs> okay, you're all going to just go quiet there? <laughs> we'll just say it this way. They would just be shocked. Are you kidding me? So you don't necessarily have to tell your daughter that either, but you can kind of put proper warnings and parameters around her. Pray, pray, pray. So, you know, what does it look like? Formed in fashion. We're formed in fashion to lead and leave, lead lovingly and sacrificially. Formed in fashion to provide. Formed in fashion in order to protect. If you're a wife today of a man trying to be a godly man, or even if he's not trying to be a godly man, uh, and you want to help him, you play a vital role. And I'll do this real quickly because I'm going to do it under a big heading. I'm going to tell you five things under a big heading without much elaboration. Um, Ephesians 5.30. I mean, we should have mutual respect for one another, but the Bible is very emphatic as it addresses the wife regarding the husband. It says, respect your husband. Your, your hus husband craves respect like he craves oxygen. I'll tell you, if you ever... Have you ever seen anybody either, uh, you know, they thought they were drowning? Have you ever seen anybody that's been cut off from oxygen? How do they begin to act? I mean, they're crazy, right? I mean, it's anything to get a breath. I want to just tell you, your husband craves respect like he craves oxygen. And when he doesn't, when he doesn't get respect, it's no excuse for it, but it's an explanation for it. Uh, he will act crazy. He will act in ways that you can't believe. Why are you acting that way? So how do I show respect? Show, show respect by being his encourager and cheerleader. Genesis 2.18 says the woman was created to be a helper. That's not a demeaning term. It's a term that's actually used for God in probably a half a dozen places in the Old Testament. Has the notion of being an encourager. You, you, should be, you really should be your husband's biggest fan, and, and he should know it. It's not sufficient for you to say, hey, I'm your biggest fan, but I don't go to any of your games and I never tell you that. And there's nothing that would indicate my actions that I feel that way. Um, respect, respect him by being his encourager, by being his helper. Show respect by employing words with wisdom. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Here's, here's a hard one. It's hard for everybody, male and female, but I'm talking to women right now. Show respect by employing words with wisdom. Refuse the ever-present temptation to criticize See, here's the thing. I know you're out in the workforce, many of you. He's out in the workforce. There's a whole bunch of criticism that comes that way. The home ought to be, somewhere along the line, at least the one safe haven that he gets where he's either, you know, it could be, it could be the criticism-free zone, right? Uh, or very minimal criticism. He needs to have a place where it, it's safe and he doesn't have to hear the, the criticism. Thirdly, show respect by trusting his judgment and aligning yourself with him. Um, <laughs> pretty self-explanatory, we'll leave it. Show respect by praying for him and with him. And show respect for him by being his, well, we'll do it this way. Show respect for him by being his willing, enthusiastic, and available lover. I told my wife a lot of times, I said, you know, <laughs> I said, I, I, I can hire somebody to clean the house. I said, I can eat out. I said, there, there's a lot of things, you know, that I could do. So if we're getting on a hierarchy of priorities in terms of what you do as a, as a wife, you know, we got cleaning, we got food. You know, I like food, but we got that. There are, there are other things. See, here's the thing. The way, the, the way God has designed it, your wife of a godly man, and he, he, he's trying to serve God, <clears throat> there's only one cup he gets to drink out of. Amen. Think about it like this. I don't know if you ever saw a marathon. You're running a marathon, and all the people are holding out the water. He's only got one that he gets to drink out of. And you can't, you can't do this. You know, he, he's, and again, you know, I can do it both sides, but I'm doing it one side right now. 
You know, he's running, he's, and he just needs that drink of water because that drink of water is going to refresh him and going to renew him. It's going to give him a second wind. And, and he's like, you know what? <sighs> I'm not doing that. No, be, a, be his lover. Do that. Be available to, uh, to him. Think about it this way. I don't know what it is, you know, that might move your soul, but I don't know. Say it's, you know, you enjoy good, rich conversation with your husband. What if he just never talked to you or never listened to you? What if that was your cup of cold water? Man, you would be, it'd be hard, wouldn't it? It would be hard. Too quiet for me. Anyhow, respect, respect him. You're going to help him. If you're the children of a man trying to be a godly father, or not for that matter, if you're children in the home, you can help. The Bible says to honor your father and mother. If you're still in the house, especially if you're in the house and you're underage, your father will be honored and blessed. And you'll help him by gladly obeying, by respectful words, and by contributing to the household chores without a bunch of aggravation about it, without threats. If you're an adult, could be living in the home, could be living out of the home. Uh, dads really actually enjoy it if you seek his counsel. I mean, I, I actually love it when some of my adult kids come and say they want to talk to me. and say, Dad, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? Seek his counsel. Affirm what he did well. Any dad worth his salt. Like, all my kids are grown up. And I was actually talking to one of my kids the other day. And I said, uh, I said you know, I said, the tendency is to think on all the things that didn't do well. You know, like, ah, oh, I should have done this. Oh, I should have done that. Boy, if you're a, an adult child and you want to you wanna help your dad affirm what he did well, because he did some things well, and bless him by his presence and service. You know, in Genesis, once again, the Bible says, you know, when we read through Genesis, we find in Genesis chapter 3 that Adam, he just messed up big time. It's called the fall. He sinned, was alienated from God, and there's a lot of brokenness that was introduced into the world. He was a... He's a sinner. Everyone that followed him, all his progeny, that means you and me and everybody, we're all sinners, all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And just a real lot of bad stuff happened as a result. But you know what? You can go all the way into Genesis. In Genesis um, 3, God actually promises. Genesis 3, verse 15, he promises that someday, this is from the proximity of Genesis, someday there's going to be a deliverer. Someday there's going to be a redeemer. Someday there's going to be someone that comes and makes everything whole. And you know that someday has come. And that someone was Jesus who came and seek at, to seek and save the lost, to forgive sins, to make men whole. Um, you know, if you've been stirred at all, if you want to be a godly man, if you want to... If you want to know what it means to be a man, if you want to know the joy, actually, of expressing your manhood and doing it appropriately and embracing the duties, uh, you know, you need to act like Jesus, and you can never act like Jesus if you don't have Jesus. You can never... See, the, 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 your sin is... You're always going to deal with it, but if you're outside of Christ, you will be so handicapped that you can hear a message like this and you won't even receive it or hear it. You'll never know the joy of what it means to be a man or a man of God or be appropriate husband or, or father. You need Jesus. So I just want to ask you and all the guys out there, do you, do you know Jesus today? And I don't mean just, you know, you know, oh, yeah, there was a guy, Jesus, historical figure, and yeah, he died, and yeah, the Bible's all about him. But do you know Jesus? In other words, do you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Have you trusted him as your Lord and Savior? Have you been forgiven of your sins? Uh, have you become a new person because Christ lives in you? You're never going to be a godly man just by trying to imitate Christ actually alone. You need Jesus in you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me ask you guys, have you... Do you know Jesus, and have you submitted yourself to the authority of God's Word? You can't, you can't act like Jesus without obeying God's Word. Do you self-consciously, third thing, do you self-consciously rely on Jesus every day? The um, Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You need to rely on Jesus. And finally, um, we see this in Genesis. Do you know Genesis? He, he created, God created Adam, and he says, it's not good for man to be alone, so he created a woman. One of the principles that we draw from Genesis right off the bat is God never intended us to live life alone. He intended us to live our life out in community. So let me ask you this last thing, guys. Do you, do you fellowship with other Christians? Specifically, do you have other men in your life that you share life together with? Because if you don't, you're never going to be able to do this. 
Do you have a, what we were talking about? Do you have a, a word? Yeah, I don't have, a, hey, Gabriel, do we have a mic? Right here is a mic up here. If you can turn it on. This is a mic for mic. This has a yellow around it. Um, tough word this morning, was it not? I mean, men, I don't know about you, but I feel like I have a lot of challenges now i got to overcome with our pastor's uh, little sermon there. But if you would, as I give this word from God, um, I would like you all to close your eyes and think about the little video we saw of uh, Dick Hoy and the fact of how his son didn't have the ability to, to do that marathon. There was no way he could do that. And yet his father did everything to take him through that. And, you, and, and did everybody notice at the end of it, the, the laughing, smiling, victorious mm -hmm. face that that son had? He felt like he did it, because in his eyes he did, okay? And I just felt like doing the worship that God was saying, like I said, please uh, close your eyes and bear with me here. <clears throat> I was saying, do you not know what it is that I want to make of you? Do you not understand what great things I plan to do with you. Does my word not say that of any man born of woman, John the Baptist, there was none greater? And yet I say to you, all who, the, the least that are in heaven is greater than he. And are you not all my sons and daughters? Are you not all children of the kingdom of God? So therefore I have plans for you that are far greater than John the Baptist. And I would say to you, if, if I truly am your God, do you believe that I created the heavens and the earth? Do you believe that I freed the, the, my people from, from Egypt? Do you believe that I sent my son to save you? Do you believe that you have the Holy Spirit within your very midst to make you stronger and to overcome anything in this world? You need to trust me. You need to believe that I am the I am, and that there is nothing that you cannot do without me, that you never walk alone. And that's why I say, just as we saw that video, that God will always take us through. We never go it alone. And men, we can become men because God says he will help us to do that. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? So it's about believing God. It's about trusting God, and he's able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all you think or ask. Uh, guys, if, if you wouldn't mind, if you wouldn't mind just standing up, and I'm going to pray for you. Uh, I'm going to just pray that God help you. I'm going to pray. You know what Mike just shared? He's saying that God, God, God is God offers Himself to come into your life and and <laughs> do in you way beyond anything that you think is even possible. He's able to do in you whatever your wildest imagination is beyond that. Some of you might struggle with. Boy, you know, I made some real mistakes. Well, God sent Christ so you can be forgiven of those things and the missteps that you took. And, and I'll tell you, just real quickly, if revival is ever going to take place, I, I became persuaded maybe about 15 years ago. We got all these different keys for revival. If revival is ever going to take place, it's going to take place because men decide to step up and be the men that God's called them to be and be able to lead their families and lead their churches. So I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you for these guys. I pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. I pray they would believe. I pray they would trust. I pray their eyes would be set upon you. Lord, as uh, the word has come forth by your spirit, Lord, I mean, it's just right in line with what you teach us in Scripture. God, you're able to do things bigger and better and more majestic and more beautiful than anything we could have imagined. I pray for these men here that you would help them. Lord, it's not an easy task to be a man of God, but Lord, you live in, in us, and we're able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And even when we think we're, we're doing it, we're, we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling, the reality is, God, is that you're at work in us, working out for your good and your will and your purpose. So all the work that we're doing is a result of the work that you're doing in and through us. I pray you bless these guys. I pray you help them in their call. If they're married, I pray you help them in their marriage. I pray you help them in their vocation, and I pray you help them in the spiritual life in church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.